Everyone thinks they understand logging until they're staring at a production issue. It's 3 a.m. and their logs have no context, no structure, and they're just sifting through a wall of text looking for that needle in a haystack that explains the issue. Let me show you some of the best tips to help you out for next time. First, let's have a clear game plan. Don't just throw log statements everywhere hoping something useful will stick. See this mess? This is exactly what happens when you log without objectives. So here's a good rule. Before you write a single log statement, think about some key questions. What are your application's main goals? What critical operations need monitoring? And what KPIs actually matter to you? Let's take error logging as an example here. Your objective isn't just to scream, hey, something broke. Your goal is to provide enough context to fix the problem. Think about what the future you wants when debugging at 3 a.m. You might start by overlogging and then trim back. It's way easier to remove the noise than to add missing information when you're already in production. Actually take the time to periodically review your logging strategy as well though, what's useful and what's just noise. Remember, the best logging strategy isn't about capturing everything, it's about capturing the right things. When you get this right, finding and fixing issues becomes so much easier. Now that we know the why we're logging though, let's talk about how. This is where log levels come in. Let's break down the four common levels that you may see. First, we have info. This is your business as usual level. Think a successful user login, important transactions, the stuff you actually care about tracking, something like user completed checkout, and then maybe the order number. Then we have the warning level. Consider this your early warning system. Something's not quite right, but your house isn't on fire yet. Something like payment processing is taking longer than usual. Then we have the error level. Now we're talking about some real problems like a failed payment or a crash service, something like database connection failed. And then finally, we have fatal. Hopefully you never see this. This is the everything's gone wrong level, either part of your stack or the entire application just crashed, something like system out of memory shutting down. Now in production, most apps default to the info level to keep things nice and clean. But, and this is crucial, you need to plan to crank up the detail when you're trying to hunt down bugs, as this may not include key troubleshooting information. This is where you should plan to log at an increased verbosity temporarily while investigating issues, and also have a way to manage that verbosity when needed as well. You may commonly see this in tools you use yourself when you're able to select the verbosity level that you want to use. Do that in your own applications as well. Speaking of keeping things nice and organized though, let's talk about structured logging. Look at this mess right here. This is what basic logging looks like. Sure, we humans can read it, but try getting a machine to make sense of that. It's gonna be a lot harder. Instead, let me show you structured logging. Here's what your logs should look like. Every piece of information has its own field. That's not just prettier, it's more powerful. Now you can filter, search, and analyze your logs. You want to find all of the timeout errors, or you need to check how many errors happened last Tuesday. Really easy to do now. Here's the cool part as well. Logging frameworks can solve this for you. Consider using one of these if you aren't already. There's tons of great options for every language. But if you find yourself using a service that doesn't support structured logging, you can also use tools like Vector to transform those logs into passable JSON as well. If your logs aren't structured, you're essentially just writing very expensive text files. So now that we've got our logs structured, let's talk about what actually goes in them. Look at this log entry here. It's essentially just saying something's wrong, which is technically true, but your future self is going to be annoyed at how useless this message actually is. A better version would be this one. Notice the difference? We've got the who, what, where, and why all in one place now. If we need to debug broken logins, you've got everything you need. You've got the user ID, location, device info, and even how many times they tried. Here's a good list of things to capture in every log entry. Request IDs for tracing requests across microservices, user IDs for user session context if it's needed, system state data like database or cache status, and then full error context as well, things like your stack traces, if they're relevant as well. Remember, your logs are your system's black box recorder. Make them detailed enough that you can replay and understand any scenario that happened, not just know that it actually happened. Let's talk about log sampling now as well, or how to keep your bill from giving you a heart attack. If you're running a high traffic system, you might be generating hundreds of gigabytes or even terabytes of logs every day. At that scale, storing every single log is expensive and mostly unnecessary. This is where sampling comes in. Instead of storing every single log, you store a representative sample. It's like a poll, you don't need to ask every person, you just need a good sample. Let's say your authentication service logs every login attempt. With a 20% sampling rate out of 10 identical login events, you'd only need to go ahead and store two of them. But here's where it gets super smart. You can be selective about what you sample. Say you're having an error spike, maybe keep all of your error logs, but sample the success logs. 
Say you're having high traffic to a specific endpoint, go ahead and sample more aggressively there, but keep full logs for your critical paths. This is another great feature where a logging framework or observability framework like OpenTelemetry can help you out with built-in sampling. This simple change can cut your logging costs by 80% or more while still giving you all the insights you need. Just remember, implement sampling early, don't wait until your logging costs spike. Next, let's talk about canonical log lines. When you're first starting out, you might log things as they happen, like the user clicked the login button, we're now checking credentials, login successful. The problem is, when something goes wrong, you're pretty much stuck playing detective, jumping between different log entries trying to figure out what happened. Not very fun. This is where canonical log lines come in. Think of it as a single log entry that tells the whole story. It's like a movie summary instead of watching all the scenes separately. For example, at the end of every request, we could create one log entry that captures everything important. What the user tried to do, who they were, what went wrong, how long it took, and even how much time we spent in the database. So next time something breaks, instead of scrolling through hundreds of logs, you've got everything you need in one place. It's like having a TLDR for every request that hits your server. There's actually a better way to do this as well, in my opinion, and that is to utilize distributed tracing with tools like OpenTelemetry. Traces allow you to maintain the entire journey of a request across all of your services, still seeing each individual step as a span, but having an easy way to link them as one full request. Check out the video on traces versus spans if you want to learn more and subscribe while you're there as well. Next up though, you know what's worse than having no logs? Having logs everywhere. Imagine you're running a modern app, you've got a web server, a database, cache, authentication service, and maybe a dozen other microservices as well. Each one's generating logs and they're all sitting in different places. Now there's an issue with your app and you're trying to check your logs across 10 different services. That's not gonna be very fun. This is why we aggregate and centralize our logs. When you funnel all your logs into one place, you can search across everything at once. You can see how problems in one service impacted another, and your whole team is looking at the same data really easily. You're not SSHing into 20 different servers just to debug one issue. Now the real magic here happens when you can correlate events. Say a user reports that they couldn't check out, now you can see the payment service was slow, which caused the cart service to time out, which made the front end show an error, all in one place, all connected. Start centralizing your logs early as well. You might think I only have two services I can manage, but trust me, by the time you really need centralized logging, you really need it. But hold up, before you start dumping all your logs into one place, let's talk about retention policies. A busy application can generate terabytes of logs in no time and storage isn't free. This is why we need a retention policy. An example of one would be something like, let's say, keeping recent logs readily available for quick debugging, moving older logs to cheaper cold storage, and then eventually saying goodbye to logs you don't really need anymore. Remember though, not all logs are created equal. Say we have error logs, maybe keep those around for 90 days. Say you have some debug logs, maybe seven days is plenty. And if you have security audit logs, those might need to stick around for a year or so. The best time to set up a retention policy is before your first cloud bill gives you a heart attack. Now let's talk about securing your logs. Think about what's in your logs. You've got user IDs, IP addresses, database queries, authentication attempts, error messages with internal details. Logs can often contain things you don't want getting out. Even if the information seems mundane, it's best to follow the security by obscurity approach and not have this information out there. So how do we lock this down? We well, can do this in three main ways. The first is encryption in transit. Protect your logs as they move from your app to storage. Then you've got encryption at rest. Keep them secure while they're stored. And then the third is access controls. Make sure only the right people can read them. For example, junior developers might only need to see basic application logs, whereas senior engineers might get access to more sensitive system logs. And then the security team might get full access for investigations. Some log managers will even provide audit logging so you can track who accessed what and when they did. Now that we know how to protect our logs though, let's talk about what should not be in them in the first place. And wow, some companies learn this the hard way. In 2018, Twitter had to force all passwords for all of our users to be reset. Why? Because they accidentally logged their passwords in plain text. Even GitHub got caught in a similar situation. These aren't small companies. These are companies with amazing engineers and they still mess this up. Here's what you don't want to log. Instead, do this. Here's a cool way to do this using Go's slog package. Now, even if someone accidentally tries to log the entire user object, only the ID shows up. It's a really nice safety net. For extra protection, set up filters in your logging pipeline to catch and redact anything that looks sensitive like credit card numbers, social security, API keys, before they even reach your log storage. 
I recommend using the Open Telemetry Collector for this. Remember, the best sensitive data leak is the one that never happens because you never logged it in the first place. Now let's talk about performance impact because yes, unfortunately writing those logs could actually take CPU cycles and memory. Here's a basic Go web server with no logging. This can handle about 192,000 requests per second. Now what happens when we add in some basic logging with a tool called Logris? Well, we see a 20% performance drop. If we use Go's newer slog package though, we only take a 3% hit, much better. So how do we keep our logs without destroying performance? Well, the first is choose an efficient logging library. Like we just saw, using slog is way better. The second is use log sampling in high traffic paths. Third, log to a separate disk partition, not the main one your application is running on. And then the fourth is make sure to run load tests to catch your logging bottlenecks early. Let's wrap up with a common mistake that I see developers make now then, and that is trying to use logs for everything. While logs are great for debugging, they're not ideal for real-time monitoring. Imagine you're trying to answer a simple question, is my service healthy right now? You could grep through your logs, count the errors, calculate rates, but this would be extremely tedious. This is where metrics come in. Logs tell you what happened. Metrics tell you how often things are happening. You can spot trends. You can set alerts, catch problems before they become disasters. Use your logs to debug problems, but use your metrics to know when you have a problem. And there you have it, 12 logging best practices that will save you countless hours of debugging and probably a few incidents too. Remember, good logging isn't about logging everything, it's about logging the right things in the right way at the right time. Start implementing these practices today, but don't forget to review and adapt them as your application and your team grows. Your future self will really thank you. If you're looking to go beyond logging as well, check out some of the other observability videos. And if you found this helpful, leave a like and subscribe for more development tips. Let me know your favorite logging tip or your logging nightmares in the comments. And as always, see you in the next one.